the next session, I would like to uh, call on stage the uh, chairpersons, uh, Dr. Kameshwar Prasad. He is the uh, he is the head of department of neurology and stroke unit and chief of neurosciences center and director of uh, clinical epidemiology at Ames New Delhi. Dr. V.B. Gupta, senior consultant pediatrician in New Delhi, and Dr. Harish Pemde. Uh, Dr. Harish Pemde is professor of pediatrics, Lady Harding Medical College in Kalawati Southern Children's Hospital, New Delhi a convener of uh, Central for Adolescent Health, KSCH New Delhi, uh, chairperson of IAP Research in Child Health Group, and uh, special interests of SIR include child clinical epidemiology, vaccinology, and adolescent health and medicine. Uh, good evening. I think all are waiting for Professor Lim. Please come. Apologies. This reminds me of my medical school interview many years ago where I was so nervous. This was in, um, I think it was in Imperial. I was so nervous, I stood up before the end of the interview and left, and they called me back, and no doubt I didn't get an offer. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's the opposite that I'm doing now. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, optimizing management in autoimmune encephalitis acknowledging that a lot that we use is actually based on NMDR information, but we have to be very careful that no, not all autoimmune encephalitides are the same as such. Uh, is that moving? Not quite yet. So um, these are the principles, I think, of treating autoimmune encephalitis. Um, I think the first question we always need to ask ourselves is, do we need to treat? Um, clearly, the paradigm we talked about of diagnosing and treating early does not take much common sense to do, but I just want to show you the emerging evidence you know, for that now, and then the how long you know, to treat for. I've left it right at the end because it's actually the most difficult you know, question, and I don't think we definitely have the, the answers. And then understanding biology of the condition itself um, to see if it helps us you know, uh, moderate our treatment, change our treatment, or target our treatment as such. So do we need to treat? Uh, I think we know now from the big work done by various groups now, particularly in this cohort in NMDR, that treatment essentially prevents death and improves outcome. So I think there's no doubt that you're not going to treat. But I think you've got to balance that with conditions that also improve spontaneously, not necessarily NMDR, but if you have you know, your typical child that you mentioned with the seizures, uh, with a viral prodrome, most of them, if you don't do anything, uh, may improve you know, spontaneously. Sometimes we find that the antibody is positive three months later when they come back to you in clinic. You may not chase those, but you would treat that in conjunction with the clinical you know, picture. So I think the other question we often ask ourselves now, very much in the ID sort of world as well, is the clinical relevance of the antibodies. And I'm glad someone brought up the, 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 the VGKC you know, story, because as you know, uh, VGKC antibodies have been reported not the, the LGI-1, not the associated uh, targets themselves, but the measured by uh, complex. I've been uh, identified in lots of conditions from demyelinating conditions down to frequent seizures, uh, rapid seizures, and they've been attributable to those syndromes. But when, um, and, and this is um, Yale um, Hackerhan, who was doing a PhD with uh, Professor Vincent, looked at all the positive cases that we had in the UK. You can see there from the, uh, this slide there that they, they, they were present in a whole range of conditions, and in Teters that were perhaps higher in encephalopathic patients, but not you know, specifically in one group or, or, or more of the patients. And when we looked at the antigens specifically on cell-based assays, we could not identify the specific targets. But instead, if you looked at some of those, that some of the targets were intracellular, suggesting that although the VGKC was a marker of the inflammatory process that we perhaps were doing the antibodies for, they were not necessarily targeting surface uh, antigens. So that's probably right in that we don't see them very much in children. And and we certainly screen a lot of children now uh, for LGI-1, Casper 2 and Contectin. In my books, I've only got two LGI-1s, uh, uh, um, and they happen, but they're ultra, ultra, you know, rare. So clinical relevance is important, and I'm just going to show you this picture, you know, of this boy. Um, 
So he's a boy with you know chronic fatigue, um, with you know we're calling this abdominal myoclonus and abdominal tics. It was a suggestible component, but someone had done the NMDR antibodies and it was positive. You know, is this an MDR mediated you know movement disorder? The mo predominantly monosymptomatic or the monosymptomatic? Or is the antibody, you know, clinically relevant? So this is where I'm going to start, you know, the, 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 the talk. So treating uh, and uh, diagnosing early. We now know from adult studies and pediatric studies uh, that early treatment definitely improves, you know, outcome. Um, Susan Byrne, who was a, a fellow with me and now a consultant, uh, looked at all the cases that presented uh, in children, just historically, just tracking it from the history rather than the study ourselves, and, and identified 80 patients. And you can see there in a, a post hoc analysis of all that data, we identified that if you defer treatment by that amount, but after about three uh, weeks, you know, you would lose your chance of full recovery pretty significantly. So you need to start, you know, treatment as early as possible. Um, this may hold true, and this is from uh, Margarita, whom you quoted the uh, NMDR an HSV review, she's been doing reviews on virtually every you know, autoimmune condition in children, very helpful. Uh, we, we think that that may hold true for LGI-1 and DPPX as well in that early treatment may improve you know, outcome. Um, crucial to the early treatment is the cr agreed criteria that we could all diagnose the patients, and this is the Grouse criteria that was mentioned earlier uh, in, in, in 2016, agreed by many, many uh, people. Uh, Integral to that is also the earlier uh, diagnosis and more rapid you know, diagnosis, and that could happen uh, in a lab-based or more commercially available uh, chip uh, this, these days. All will have its positive pros and cons. The one that is perhaps more specific may take a lot longer to do, and the one that is less specific may compromise on specificity and sensitivity. You need to know what your local test is, and you need to know when to ask for the more additional ones that are beneficial. So that's, that's the important you know, message. But I think I'm always a fan of using criteria, but also making sure that the criteria actually purports, you know, or support, it, uh, their support for using it. So for example, uh, the NMDR criteria, uh, and this is from uh, Russell Dale's group, who looked at whether we could validate it in a pediatric population. And we certainly can do for the clinical criteria, but if you look at the CSF, the, um, and, uh, and MRI, it is very difficult to, because we know that children have got less reactive CSF, although if we did the oligoclonal bands and perhaps done them a little bit later, because a lot of times we do the CSF a little bit too early at the time point of presentation, whereby they have not developed bands yet, and if we had repeated them later, it might be positive, but because of that, you have to be careful if you're using that to exclude treatment or to exclude making a diagnosis. Nonetheless, the biomarker for that is so good now, the CSF, uh, that we would use that as a positive you know, marker. So early treatment, early diagnosis, if we were to pick them up so early at a monosymptomatic stage before they develop the polysymptomatic, so if you look at the original work from uh, uh, the international you know, uh, study that was published by Martin Tichula, we know that about uh, all of them, virtually all of them, got worse after about four weeks. I'm just gonna show you some videos of patients that have presented bad, but these were early videos that were picked up by the parents, and this is actually one when she had a seizure coming into hospital. And you see that subtle writhing you know, hand movement there, the myrhythmia, um, and if I were to show you the whole video with sound, uh, we were probably asking her something, so she probably did have some word-finding difficulties there. So not really that you know, monosymptomatic as such, but certainly not encephalopathic at a stretch of imagination. And this is a, a much younger uh, girl, and this was two weeks before she came into hospital. Can you see that stereotypic touching of the ear uh, before she then developed a much um, slower, progressive loss of you know, social skills? So these are two examples of patients that then went on to have a more progressive course of encephalopathy. And I'm sure if we picked it up then, given them steroids or given them one dose of IVIG, we may have switched it off. So I think the 
So, in, so you also, it was also mentioned earlier that only 1% of these patients are monosymptomatic. And I think the answer to that is that there is a changing face of uh, earlier recognition. And therefore, if you were to do a study now, and we've just done that in our cohort of um, 45 uh, patients, of which 20 were NMDR, only 30%, sorry, 30 were not encephalopathic. But I think it's because we're picking, picking them earlier, not because they don't become encephalopathic. Um, this is another example. This is your, uh, a boy with, uh, with PERM, actually, who was in intensive care um, with um, seizures and rigidity. And this was three weeks earlier. Um, and mum picked up the video. Um, I'm not sure you can see there, but every time he puts the spoon into his mouth, he just clenches his jaw. Um, and... He, they, they're a sort of family from Polish sort of background, and mum, sort of a no-nonsense woman, just you know made him have his breakfast and then go to school, and then felt really guilty three weeks later and showed me this video saying, do you think that was the onset of the symptom? I clearly said I didn't think so, but obviously I do think so, so that she doesn't feel entirely you know, responsible. But he did very well on steroids and mm -hmm. IVIG and made a very good you know, recovery. But had we had picked it up then, might we have presented, prevented him from going into intensive you know, care? Um, so that's one about early recognition and how clinically it may be you know, beneficial. So what do we do when we, once we've started the, the sort of diagnosis, depending on how quickly you get your antibodies you know, back, um, you would start treatment. And your treatment, as you said, would be a combination of oral steroids, you know, IVIG, or escalating to plasma exchange in that order. Uh, or, you know, if you were, had a very sick child, you might consider plasma exchange first before, you know, giving the IVIG so that you don't wash all the IVIG away. And that's a standard, you know, clinical common sense, you know, paradigm that we use. Um, in general, if you look at an MDR and cephalitis, no one treatment is beneficial over the other, almost certainly because you use all three of them and it's difficult to dissect up who's had one, you know, or the other. But... Um, in LGI-1, so we don't see this very much in children, uh, Sarosh Irani's work um, uh, in Oxford have demonstrated that if you do catch them in the pre-encephalopathic stage, avoid, avoiding them being encephalopathic, you may prevent longer-term you know, cognitive deficits. I think you should or we should apply that sort of you know, paradigm to our you know, children as well um, when we treat them. So this is one of the questions we're asking in the UK at the moment, because you remember we talked about etiologies of encephalitis, and immune and infection, particularly HSV, are the two commonest. In parallel to this is that and there's an adult study going on at the moment asking if um, steroids in addition to acyclovir is beneficial for HSV you know, patients. This is sort of the, the DEX, a DEX study. Um, so we wanted to ask if early treatment with IVIG would be beneficial uh, for patients when they present with encephalopathy, irrelevant of what the cause is. So if it's steroids, sorry, if it's um, in, in suspected immune, they would have had steroids, it would be an add-on. If it's suspected infective, they might be on acyclovir and the IVIG would be add-on. This is within five days. My, my, was it, was it difficult getting you know, the patients? The study was halted. The primary funders have pulled the funding because we could not recruit enough, but we've managed to get secure you know, secondary funding now to continue the study at a much watered-down level, meaning less other than primary outcome measure. But we think this is an important you know, study to look at whether early treatment is going to be beneficial. Um, I want to touch briefly on plasma exchange for two reasons. One is that it is very, very difficult to access plasma exchange uh, in a lot of our uh, centers. We often consider that only a lot later on in the algorithm. So meaning two weeks, you know, three weeks. So you would start with steroids, three to five days. You might add IVIG. You wait seven to 10 days. You make a clinical decision. That's usually three to four days of, you know, negotiating, getting lines in. So only by week three do you start to get, you know, a, a plex. And this is a paper that I think should make us rethink that strategy. Okay, so these are, this is an NMO spectrum disorder. So slightly different, but just using the concept of why, um, uh, or we may have to consider that early. So this, the, the history of NMO uh, spectrum disorder is that in the previous analysis of it, PLEX has not been shown to be entirely beneficial. But this group challenged that by saying, well, it's because PLEX, you, you, we only ever did them after three weeks, so it was probably too late anyway. So if you look at that data there, it is really interesting 
that the benefit from Plex is beneficial from about you know, five days onwards. And then by the time you get to three weeks, all the benefit you're going to get from it is gone. So if, you, if, so if you're likely to benefit from Plex, it's going to be early. So should we be thinking about you know, any studies in future should not be Plex right at the end. It should be Plex right at the beginning, particularly you know, if they're very severe. I'm not suggesting that that's what we should do with autoimmune encephalitis, but I'm suggesting that we need to rethink our strategy if we want to find the correct answer. Okay, so that's you know, plasma exchange. I think the least controversial, at least in my books, is that if you don't respond to that, you need second line you know, therapy, and we should be very fast in moving on with second line therapy. And I'm delighted to hear that your, your girl, you know, when it failed Ritux, went on to cyclophosphamide and actually responded you know, to, to, to that. And this is the evidence for that. And this is what I call you know, the, the, the Mona Lisa of the sad autoimmune uh, interest person like myself, in that you look at that picture and it tells you different things, but it also tells you different things at different time. But I'm gonna summarize that because uh, I don't think we have time to go through every single aspect of that. But essentially, that's all the patients that presented in that cohort of more about, about 500 patients. Uh, panel B is all the patients that presented and responded to first-line therapy. Panel C are patients that did not respond to first-line therapy and did not get second-line therapy. And D, of course, got second-line therapy. And you can see the additional benefit in the MRS. I'm assuming everybody knows what the MRS is in that it's a categorical scale of zero to six, of which one end is death and the other is normal recovery, actually six and the other way around. So additional benefit of second-line therapy. Um, in pediatrics, we've looked at it with Russell uh, Dale, and we've also shown the same you know, benefit, and that stratifies to about four weeks uh, for, for, for rituximab um, in NMDR and encephalitis. So if we gave it after uh, four weeks, the patients did poorer. Just be cautious that this is an investigator based outcome measure, not an objective outcome measure beyond the MRS. Um, so, principles of treating, undeniably, I think, for me, diagnose and treat you know, early. But then as we do that, we keep challenging the boundaries, isn't it? You keep saying, how long? How many people should we be treating on Ritux? Should we be treating early you know, on Ritux? And these are the questions that I think we are only starting to answer now, but I think we need to answer it very systematically um, in the sort of correct way um, so that we get the best data you know, possible. So you know that relapse is one of the reasons why we treat uh, lots of these conditions. And this is the NMDR study again from Martin Titler, essentially showing uh, three things. If you look at panel B, you look at patients that have had no treatment. You know, there's a relapse rate of about 20 to 30 percent. If patients with first-line therapy but no second-line therapy, there's a relapse of about you know, 12, maybe 15 percent, depending on which time point you look at it. And then in the patients who were treated with second line, there was a relapse rate of about 8 to 10 percent. So what that graph tells me is that there are patients that you relapse because you don't treat them adequately. But there's also a second group of patients that have got an inherent biology to have chronic inflammation that they would probably relapse anyway, irrelevant of how much you put them on initially. Okay, so this is where the question of your main question of maintenance, you know, therapy comes on. How long, you know, is that for? Imagine that's a two-year, you know, window already. Do you want to be exposing your patients to two years of, you know, immuno, you know, suppression? Um, so I'm going to um, look at the evidence of whether more second-line therapy would be beneficial. And this is a French paper of about 30 you know, patients. And you, the thing to note there, and I'm not sure you can see it, but I'm hoping, um, where is it? Um, yeah, 72% of those patients had rituximab in their cohort. And commonly, in most other cohorts, it's about 30 you know, to 40%. If you look at the outcome there, I cannot convince myself that the difference in outcome, in terms of good outcome, as defined by MRS of zero to two usually, uh, but you can see that there's a slight drop in relapse rate in their cohort there. So that's an early signal that you know, it may help you know, relapse rate. Uh, but I think it mirrors the adult data, uh, and this is rituximab in acute limbic encephalitis. This is not just an MDR. This is 
antibody positive and antibody negative as well. And I think you can see there that the message is that if you are symptomatic as measured by MRS, there is an added benefit of Ritux. If you are not symptomatic, or you've improved already, giving the Ritux doesn't change your outcome. They didn't look at sort of relapses. So I think for me, it's a consistent message. You're treating different things. Outcome as measured by MRS, you're probably not going to alter. You might change the risk of relapse in, in, in patients. So these are now well standardized outcome measures pooled from different uh, studies. And uh, again, Margarita has done all the hard work for, 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 for us. Uh, and then there's an adult you know, equivalent of that study. I mean, I've just merged the two. And you can use that as standard of what the good outcome is when trying to power for studies to look at you know, an improvement from that. And you can see that if you use an MRS of 0 to 2, it's very, very difficult to get the numbers for the study. You're going to be looking at at least four to 500 patients in each, in each group. Um, we also know the seizure outcome. And some of you were asking about you know, the antibody negative and antibody positive. In children, the, if you were positive, you're most likely to be an MDR, then the, the GABAs and a, a few of the glycines, and then the rest are antibody negative. If you use the strict criteria of having and another feature like CSF positivity or MRI positivity, we think it's about 40% you know, of that group. Then there's another you know, big group that, as you said, MRI negative, everything negative, and you really don't know what to call it. At best, it's sort of a post-infectious you know, encephalitis. So um, it's, the striking thing about the differences between the two is that NMDR encephalitis has a much lower chance of developing you know, epilepsy. And DRE stands for drug-resistant -res epilepsy. In the um, uh, Australian cohort, none of them had DREs. In our cohort, about three of them had. But that's because some of our patients are the post-HSV patients uh, in that. And that's quite a long time now. That's, about, that's a two-year uh, cohort um, study. I wanted to finish this section by telling you why I think MRS is probably not the best outcome measure for these um, children. And this is a, a, a nice picture drawn by a 15-year-old who was recovering from uh, an MDR encephalitis. And the first picture is when she was just out of intensive care, um, actually said to be doing quite well, and was asked to draw on a dog or a cat, I can't remember, and she couldn't do it. And she, was, and she had to get instructions saying that it was a head and four legs, and that's what she drew. And Near the, um, sorry, the second one down is when she was discharged to um, her home. And then the third one is, I think, four, 12 months or 15 months. You'll have to look up that article now. So 15 months later, despite having gone home with an MRS, would have been at least a one or two, is still so disabled. You know, this is a 15-year-old. So I think we're missing a trick if we're using MRS as the only outcome measure. But nonetheless, we don't have any others that we can use. Uh, obviously, imaging is a new uh, modality that we can use. So this is a study from the, uh, uh, the, the German uh, group uh, looking at connectivity uh, and also functional anisotropy and finding that in symptomatic patients with cognitive decline, this, or cognitive impairment, despite negative imaging, demonstrate abnormality. So a suggestion that these could be markers that we can use as well uh, in future. Um, so the end of the paradigm is the maintenance you know, treatment you know, that we talked about. Um, we empirically put them on it. Um, it appears to be related to previous experiences, i.e. how many patients relapse once you put them on six months uh, of steroids and then you put them on a little bit more and then you put them on a little bit more. But most of us now would, you know, at least for an MDR encephalitis, recommend that they're on some form of immuno uh, maintenance treatment for up to a year. If you happen to give Ritux already and you know that they're going to be B cell depleted for that period of time, up to then, so you don't need to be any, you don't need to have anything more after that. But these are the milder ones that you get better. You know that's the, that's the difficult one, and certainly for us, we would do that, and we would use pulse uh, uh, steroids rather than uh, regular steroids because we think that it improves the side effect, you know, profile, and certainly for bone growth, you know, etc. Um, what's the evidence that maintenance therapy uh, makes a difference? Ours is a small cohort of only 46. We hope to double that up with another uh, cohort, uh, or even uh, uh, perhaps uh, an Indian uh, cohort here. Um, 
what we do is that uh, we measure, we compare patients that were put on acute treatment only. Acute treatment meaning that you still could get second line, but you stopped when the patient was better, or patients that went electively into, to have maintenance therapy for a period of time, usually up to two years, and this could be mycophenolate, azathioprine, uh, or retux, preemptively, or patients that were put on maintenance only at relapse. And as you can see there, the only thing we could confirm was that it prevented relapse. I don't, the IQ scores, um, we're looking at more carefully at the moment into the subdomains, and there probably is a signal that if you look at domains of one or two that are problematic, you find that putting, being sick for a long time or being symptomatic for a longer time makes it more difficult for yourself, i.e. more relapses you get, the more difficult it is. So it's an early signal that maintenance therapy may have the additional you know, benefit, but it also has the additional risk that you need to think about. Okay, so the final uh, principle, I'm delighted I've got um, six minutes on the clock there, is understanding uh, biology, uh, blood-brain barrier. It's the most important thing that we sometimes often overlook, and I was delighted to hear the discussions a little bit earlier on about your treatments for uh, you know, some of the CNS infection that you know about CNS penetration for a lot of these treatments. We know a little bit less about that. We know that Ritux gets in. We know that cyclophosphamide gets in. Uh, you know, we know that you know, MMF may moderate different things outside the brain, but if you were to take a strategy of trying to target you know, uh, where the inflammatory response is, then then if you were to look at NMDR encephalitis that has got a very reactive CSF, should we not be you know, targeting uh, uh, intrathecally? And that's what a French group did. And I've certainly heard of very good responses to intrathecal metotrexate. So this is not difficult. This is pretty cheap. And provided you do it in conjunction with a, uh, oncology you know, colleagues that do it so often, the dangers may be limited, albeit you just need to be careful about the effects of metotrexate on, on the brain as well. So I'm just suggesting this as a, as a thought thing rather than this we should definitively do it. And I do know that, uh, again, Margarita has done a, a systematic review on the, these sort of treatments, and it's, it's coming out soon uh, in, in DevMed. Um, cellular targeting of inflammation. So this is getting more sophisticated in terms of the targeting. It, you know, more specific B cell targeting, more specific, and borrowing from drugs that we use, you know, from multiple you know, sclerosis. I always like to stop at this point and pause to, to, to remind all of us that not many patients move down this line. So we often agonize about these patients because they're the most difficult you know, to treat. Um, but bear in mind that these patients that are more difficult to treat often are very disabled anyway. So you need to balance that. Whereas the, the big question could be how could we treat the bulk of patients to actually improve their outcome you know, a lot more. So it's a nice you know, balance. Um, and there are again, more monoclonals that you can think about, and some of the monoclonals are starting to target you know, transduction molecules and small molecules. So this is what I call an anti-small you know, small molecule. Some of you may have heard of anakinra. Uh, that, that's strictly not a monoclonal, but an uh, IL-1 uh, antagonist. So we know that uh, tocilizumab, which is IL-6, uh, has been used in treatment-resistant uh, autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, botizumab, which is an antiplasma cell in NMDR encephalitis with some moderate benefit. These are all, um, at least the botizumab study is a cohort study, and at the same time, all the patients were getting lots of other treatment as well. But the temporal relationship to the improvement of botizumab uh, is, I think, compelling enough for you to consider it, but it is a whole new uh, ball game. Um, so I think this is a, a, a summary um, or, or a, a more recent review that Russell uh, and I did looking at the refractory uh, treatments and how we should be thinking about moving on to third line, uh, but also thinking about preventing uh, chronic and relapsing disease, albeit it is just opinion-based rather than predominantly you know, evidence-based at the moment. So in understanding uh, biology, that's hopefully two minutes or one minute? Um, two minutes. So in understanding biology, you need to understand if it's an antibody-mediated disease, how it works. And this is Professor Vincent's uh, slide on the acetylcholine uh, receptor. And not to forget that internalization is one of the mechanisms whereby you get some of the symptoms. So if you have internalization of the antibodies or internalization as the mechanism, then flogging the autoimmune process you know, isn't going to help. Um, and, as an aside, I thought I'd quickly mention this. We know that uh, in Ritux, 
um, some of the um, F3C, the receptors, these are the receptors that actually IgG binds to before it internalizes. Polymorphism, polymorphisms in those predicts response to rituximab. This may be the same with other biologics as well, and not forgetting that IVIG also behaves that way. So we need to have a better you know, understanding for that. Ultimately, I think the other thing to think about is that the dysfunction is due to a synaptic you know, dysfunction, not just an immune dysfunction as a result to that. And there's some very nice, elegant animal uh, models now demonstrating both the internalization and as a result of that, the cells cannot make uh, the LTPs. These are potentiations that you need for synaptic uh, or memory you know, formation. And um, what is also very evident is that you can reverse that in a way that is not due to immune treatment. So Efrin-2 is a membrane stabilizer to prevent the uh, internalization of, of the cells. So these are additional things that are gonna improve the patient outcome without immune uh, treatment. And the final slide is to demonstrate that other people are thinking of different strategy where you can upregulate or downregulate uh, proteins uh, particularly, you know, gabergic or, or a receptor, sorry, at different points of the pathways, remembering that two negative makes a positive in, in a network um, to uh, alleviate, uh, attenuate either a very um, excitable network or a very hypo-excitable um, network. Uh, so I think to summarize, um, we, I hope to show you that patients get better anyway, and we should be thinking about treating them. We must never treat in isolation to the antibody uh, result. Uh, we are a long way from optimally man managing these patients. I think very careful uh, collection of outcomes is going to be a starting point uh, of these patients before we do randomized you know, controlled trials, which are very difficult to do. Uh, and maybe we, we must think about, or not maybe we must think about you know, secondary biological pathways that can change you know, the outcome of patients. And with that, I'd like to thank all the groups that I've worked in, all the, my very hard uh, working uh, registrars, um, colleagues who let me come here whilst they do the clinics and things, um, and, and um, the group in Oxford, uh, and all those many years that I was working with uh, Professor Vincent and Dr. Hackerhand, who in, in, in fact should be the, perhaps the one giving this uh, talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Lim, for such an illustrious talk and a very time. Can I have just a couple of questions, please, before I open the house? In the plasma exchange, when you say that, um, in your cohort, like first line your steroids and then your IVIG, and then you, and you said that you waited for and you weighed your options for that uh, few days, four or five days. So in that cohort, uh, when you look at these cases who did not respond to the first line treatment, how much response did you get in plasma exchange depending on the duration and how many cycles? Do you have any data on that? No, we don't have a data in that. In fact, when we looked at it more systematically in a UK you know, wide cohort, you, you find the typical what we call paradox of that in that you were treating the patients with plasma exchange because they were more severe patients. So sure. if you were to analyze it, you would say actually plasma exchange made the patients worse if you get what I mean. So um, the duration to recovery, you cannot distinguish them from, at least in my view, you cannot distinguish them from natural recovery if it was going to happen you know, anyway. Because we actually don't know what the normal trajectory is for improvement in that patient. Right, anything in the short term, because like in steroids and IVI, you see that response very quickly within days. Yeah. And plasma exchange, any, no. If you, if you don't see a response very quickly uh, in, uh, in steroids and IVIG, in my experience, or certain, and I think in a lot as well, um, IVIG doesn't, sorry, plasma exchange doesn't give you the rapid you know, improvement that you see. In fact, by contrast, it can give you a deterioration first before they improve, and one of the reasons I think it's due to that is because it totally gets rid of all the anticonvulsants, all the you know, treatments that you give for a time being before it improves again. The second explanation for that, obviously, is that these are brain-bound. You're removing it properly, so it takes a longer time for it to be better. So certainly if we see an improvement, it is no sooner than I would say 10 days or you know, 15 days. Occasionally you get a report from the parents that the encephalopathy is better after two or three doses. But I think if we put that through to more objective testing, it wouldn't hold. More subjective questions. Okay. Right, any other questions from the house? Dr. 
happening. My question is uh, regarding use of biomarkers uh, for, you know, guiding therapy and, you know, individualizing therapy. So yeah. Yeah. Case, what kind of biomarkers would you suggest yeah. for monitoring no, very CSF good. information? Very good question. Um, and certainly for, you know, CSF uh, inflammation, the, the biggest, uh, you know, work done in children is from the Australian uh, group. Uh, Kavita, who was uh, Russell's PhD student, has worked extensively on this. Um, I think the, we're still at a very early phase of what, you know, where we're at in terms of identifying the types. But as you know, the two big ones that are out there are the interleukins and CS CXCL13. And it's interesting that, um, uh, Professor Newton mentioned CXCL13 in Lyme's borreliosis as well, because that's actually a marker of B cell you know, activity, not that specific to that. So maybe we could start using that. What I've been using is actually the intrathecal bands. Uh, and this is simple to do, and we can do it in most centers. And for, so going back to your question about maintenance therapy, um, we would uh, consider in children that we think it's adequate to do that, to treat uh, the um, with maintenance therapy until we get no bands. And that could be a year, that could be 18 months, quite a while. So bands, for me, are the only clinically available uh, validated tests in addition to some emerging biomarkers, of which one of the interleukins and CXL13, a chemokine for B cell being one of them. CSF B cells and CSF CD4 to CD8 ratio, do you also use those? We, we don't, but I'm not seeing convincing evidence that that is uh, a, a, a good marker, number one. And, and I don't know if you, um, the only available literature on that, as you know, is the Opsoclonus, Myclonus data from Prinzatelli's group. So he's got very good reference ranges for them. But um, the only other person that I've seen got good reference range for that is uh, Martin Hauser in, 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 in uh, Germany. And if you ask labs uh, that, um, they find that difficult to replicate. So if I were to go to my lab now and say, what are the markers, they, could, they would do it, but we wouldn't have our own reference. We would just be able to reference uh, you know, theirs. Um, maybe serially, we could, we could do that. Um, we could borrow, perhaps, um, from the um, MS data, so there are some groups now, um, particularly Amit Baro in, 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 in sort of Canada, looking at peripheral, though not, this is not CSF, biomarkers of chronic inflammation. Um, you may have heard of the CD4, CD8 ratio that has changed in MS patients. So do we stop when we've reversed that, you know, immuno or more immune phenotype? I think those are very interesting questions that will emerge, but we, we're not there yet, and I certainly, you know, don't use those. So would you use oligoclonal bands for monitoring disease activity in anti-MOG and anti-NMO, no. antibody positive? Only, only, only in antibody positive and only in you know, NMDR. And sometimes in the antibody negative uh, patients where I just don't know what to do because we have no a priori knowledge and they were band positive, I would immune, I would treat them on maintenance therapy until they became band negative. But I'm sure there will be a patient that is band negative, and then when they relapse, become band positive again. But that's life. Thank you. OK, thank you, uh, Professor Lim. And now we would like to call upon the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Angela Vincent. Uh, Dr. Angela Vincent is an emeritus professor of neuroimmunology. Where is she? Yeah just for the sake of time, please come. Her area of interest are antibody-mediated diseases of peripheral and central nervous system. More than 400 peer-reviewed papers, edited four books, and numerous commentaries and uh, editorials, please. Yes. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to come here, and um, particularly to Dr. Shefali for, for many correspondence by email, trying to get it all to, together. What do you, uh, is that not on or, or anyway? Um, I must say, after that really fantastic afternoon of talks, I'm not quite sure that this is going to be so exciting. And I hope um, that it's uh, not too dull compared with, with some of the other topics. I ought to say straight away, in, in case you don't know, that I'm not, I am medically qualified, but I haven't touched a patient for 49 years because I've spent all that time in the laboratory. So what I know about clinical medicine, and particularly clinical neurology, 
comes from talking to my colleagues like Dr. Lim, Dr. Hackerhan, Dr. Suki Wright, all of whom are pediatricians and neurologists. And this has been very exciting for me. And I much appreciate their collaborations and interest. So I'm going to talk about the relapsing demyelinating syndromes. And the antibody-mediated ones, of course, are very important now because multiple sclerosis needs to be distinguished from neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorders. I think you probably know enough about them, so I won't go into great details. And MOG antibody disease, which is the sort of latest um, addition, which is really going to be, I think, particularly important to you as pediatric neurologists and pediatricians. So, of course, neuromyelitis optical or Devic's disease is classically a combination or sequential optic neuritis and longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis. And it's now recognized to be a severe relapsing remitting disease of the CNS and distinct from multiple sclerosis. And it has, in fact, a much more rapid and potentially disabling course because the patients accumulate disability with each relapse. So preventing relapse is the most important thing. Have I gone? Sorry, I've gone the wrong way. So um, in 2004, 14 years ago, Van der Lennon and her colleagues in the Mayo Clinic discovered that there was some antibody staining of brain tissue, rodent brain tissue, um, which had a very characteristic pattern, which you can see in the middle there. And then the year later, they discovered that the antigen was actually aquaporin-4. And that discovery has really changed the um, uh, approach to diagnosis of this condition, which previously had not really been distinguished from multiple sclerosis. So nowadays there are um, cri diagnostic criteria, of course, and these have in fact even um, been adapted in 2015 to include aquaporin-4 antibody in the serum. Note, they were never testing it in the, in the CSF, so that's not some, uh, an antibody we tend to test in the CSF. Um, and so now it's, it's um, relatively easy to find um, a diagnosis of this condition. But you'll see that not everybody has the antibody. So how do you measure the antibodies? Well, you've heard a little bit about this, but just to show you on, the, on your left, a cell that is expressing the aquaporin-4, which in fact in this case has actually been made green with a fluorescent protein. The patient's antibodies are yellow binding to the green protein and they are detected with a red fluorescent secondary antibody. So when you look down the microscope, as you can see at the bottom left, you see the green cells surrounded by a halo of red fluorescence. And that means that that serum has got antibodies to the aquaporin-4. Whereas a patient who does not have those antibodies, or a healthy person, um, you see the green cells, but you don't see the red rim because no antibody has attached to the, the green protein. And this scoring can be um, score, um, the binding can be scored, and, and we do that regularly on patients of many kinds. And we use live cells for this because we want the antibodies only to bind to the outside of the protein. We don't want to detect antibodies that are directed against intracellular epitopes because we don't think that those antibodies are likely to be pathogenic. So we love these live cell assays, but they are hard work. And the commercial assays use fixed cells or even ELISAs in some cases. And we're not quite sure that those are so good, but you'll wait and see. So my colleagues in Oxford have done a lot of studies on neuromyelitis optica. And I think this is interesting. It's now several years old, this paper. But I think it shows you that there are some ethnic differences and particularly the Afro-Caribbeans in the UK um, seem to have much earlier disease and much more pediatric disease, whereas the Caucasians and, Afro and Asians have more or less the same demographics, as you can see with the blue uh, and the purple bands, uh, columns there. So aquaporin-4 antibody disease is rare. We reckon it's about 1% to 2% of MS patients in the UK. About 
150 new cases in the UK per year. I don't think, sorry, I think that one to two percent should be of per million in the UK. Strong female preponderance occurs in all ethnic groups, but it does seem to be relatively more common in those of Asian and Afro-Caribbean ethnicity, because if you look back here, there are just as many Afro-Caribbeans and Asians as there are Caucasians. And yet in the UK, we are not 50-50 with Asians and, and, and Afro-Caribbeans. So there clearly are a lot of patients with that ethnicity or those ethnicities. The mean age at disease onset is 40 years, but it can occur at any age, and disability increases with each relapse, so relapse and tre treatment prevention are essential. Myelitis is uh, mainly cervical or thoracic. The speed of onset in disease is highly variable, but you can get acute onset mimicking spinal cord infarction. But typically, it's more subacute, and it may be sort of on and off for a few weeks. Very important, um, perhaps not mentioned so much today, preceded by hiccups or intractable vomiting. And this is now a very well-known sign for neuromyelitis optica um, in, in patients of, I think, all ages. And back pain and pain in general seems to be a really characteristic of the patients with, with transverse myelitis and can be very difficult to treat. And they also sometimes get dystonic spasms, which can be severe and may be responsive to carbamazepine, but they are often also intractable. But it's interesting that those who develop motor, permanent motor disability are mostly the older patients, and this is age at onset of permanent motor disability. Whereas if you take optic neuritis, this is usually unilateral, may be painful or painless, usually retrobalba, and the patients who get these optic neuritis onset attacks are significantly younger than patients with the transverse myelitis onset attacks. In fact, 61% with disease of onset less than 30 years, which does include children, of course, presented with optic neuritis. And in children, it does seem to be that permanent visual disability is the big risk. And we know some of the patients in the UK where that has become a very sad um, consequence of this disease. Brain disease is also much more common in children than in adults, <clears throat> and brain and brainstem attacks can be a presenting feature. This seems to be quite rare in Caucasians and more common in children, Asians, and Afro-Caribbeans. And it can occur in the absence of optic neuritis or transverse myelitis, so this is always a diagnosis you need to look out for. And here from Brenda Brown, um, sorry, from Sylvia Tenenbaum's um, study in neurology a couple of years ago, there's some really nice examples of MRIs from children with pediatric neuromyelitis optic uh, spectrum disorders. And I won't go into the details because I'm sure your evaluation of, of MRIs is much better than mine. Unfortunately, you can sometimes see MS-like lesions, which could be a little bit um, confusing or, or misleading, but black holes are said to be uncommon, and I think there's usually other signs of neuromyelitis optica which could help with the diagnosis. So the important thing about neuromyelitis optica, of course, is that it's a much more destructive disease, potentially, um, than MOG antibody disease, which I'll talk about in a moment. And it's very much a disease that seems to be driven by complement. The antibodies are IgG1 and IgM, in fact, and both of those can activate complement. And the lesions that you can see in patients are probably very much dependent on the activation of complement, which you can see on the right-hand side there, um, which is a perivascular, in rims or rosettes around the vessels. It's therefore not altogether surprising that one of the better and most interesting treatments that have been published recently is a complement inhibitor, eculizumab, which of course would really attack the end point of the disease where you get complement activation and immune complexes 
actually forming in the lesions. And the data from that, which you may well have seen because it was published in 2013 from the Mayo Clinic, um, is shown here. And the line, and if I can use this, here shows you when they first gave the infusion of the drug. And you can see the number of relapses that there were before the drug and how very few there were after the drug. So it did seem to be a very effective way of stopping relapses in neuromyelitis optica. But it was an open label study, um, of course, as a first try. The other side about, the other thing about um, treatments that is relatively new also is that the plasma cells and the B cells, of course, become plasma cells and the plasma cells make the antibody. So if you can inhibit the plasma cells or even get rid of them, that would be a very good way of treating the patients, if, particularly if they were antigen specific. Nobody's done that yet, but just using an IL-6 inhibitor, which affects the B cells and plasma cells, has also been shown to be quite effective in this paper from the German group, um, which occurred, uh, appeared about three years ago. And what was particularly interesting here is that many of the patients did have really severe pain, and it seemed that treating them with an IL-6 receptor inhibitor was able to help quite considerably with their pain. And that was, a, I think, a rather important sort of secondary outcome that perhaps hadn't been predicted because the pain can be particularly intractable. So NMO and acroporin-4 antibody-related diseases, there is a widening spectrum. These, these conditions need to be identified. There's a poor adverse or adverse response to typical disease-modifying treatments, or at least many of them, um, the, the MS treatments in typical patients. So one really wants to beware missing the diagnosis of neuromyelitis optica and giving them the wrong treatment. It does require aggressive and sustained immunotherapies to prevent accumulation of disability, and complement activation and neurotreatments treatments targeting B cells are probably going to be um, important in the future. Whatever you do, whatever you look at with clinical features that fulfill the criteria of neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorders, you always find some patients who don't have aquaporin-4 antibodies. And this is just trying to show you how isolated or recurrent optic neuritis, recurrent longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, brain or brainstem attacks, classical, even classical neuromyelitis optica, there are only a proportion of patients that have aquaporin-4 antibodies. There have always been patients who are negative. And in fact, aquaporin-4 positivity is relatively low in children, perhaps as many as 42% of neuromyelitis cases in pediatric studies are negative for the aquaporin-4 antibodies. So you've really got a disadvantage there. Why is that? Well, I think it's because there's another antigen which is actually much more important in children and which often presents, the antibodies often present with very similar features. And that's antibodies to MOG. And whereas aquaporin-4 is on the astrocytes, shown at the bottom there, MOG is, of course, a myelin. I hope that's all right here. A myelin protein and is, um, therefore, uh, a, a antibody which could be ta attacking the myelin itself. So in a very early study we did, which was not including children, um, we looked at MOG antibody positive and aquaporin-4 antibody positive patients with neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorders. So clinically they were not easy to tell the difference, but there were less females in the MOG antibody positive patients. There was more of the, the simultaneous optic neuritis and transverse myelitis. There were more conus lesions on the MRI, and there was more ADEM-like features and relapses initially in our studies were very rare indeed compared with the aquaporin-4 antibody patients. So quite clear differences in those respects. In fact, since then we've changed the antibody testing we do and we've refined it and we think improved it. And we now have a, what we believe to be a very clean assay 
with live cells where the positive patients we get are very importantly not multiple sclerosis, but they are NMOSD, aquapoin 4 negative, ADEM type, relapsing optic neuritis mostly, um, but with lot of, quite a lot of other phenotypes as well. So this is a clean assay detecting MOG antibodies and it helps to discriminate from patients with multiple sclerosis or with um, what will turn out to be multiple sclerosis. So they really are helpful in children and I'm going to talk quite a bit about the work of Yale Hackerhen, who we've already mentioned, who was very much mentored and supervised by um, Ming Lim uh, during her PhD with, with me um, and is now beginning to be an independent investigator um, based at the moment in, in Great Ormond Street. So Yale um, did a results from a national surveillance cohort um, initially, she had 65 children with acute demyelinating events. 23 of them had MOG antibodies. And when she looked at the patient's um, notes of two years after the initial event, she found that only two of the 23 who had developed in apparent multiple sclerosis um, by two years had MOG antibodies, where 16 out of the 42 who didn't developed multiple sclerosis had MOG antibodies. And in fact, the diagnosis was revised in the two children who, who had been thought to have multiple sclerosis. So it began to look as if MOG antibodies were definitely going to distinguish children with out multiple sclerosis for, from those who did have multiple sclerosis. And that seemed very encouraging. In fact, there's a, quite a lot of evidence now that MOG antibodies are of common in children. Um, you can see on the left the distribution of age at onset in samples that have been sent to Oxford for testing. And you see there's always a um, shift towards the younger age. Below 20, um, the majority of patients are, um, and well, it's about 30% of them are, are below the age of 20. In fact, if you look at the clinical phenotypes, it's the ADEMs who seem to present very early, um, often peaking at about five years in the distribution, whereas optic neuritis peaks at five to 15 years somewhat later, and the other transverse myelitis and optic neuritis and transverse myelitis are less clearly distributed. But the very youngest cases seem to get an ADEM. So Yale and, and her colleagues um, established a diagnostic algorithm for relapsing acquired demyelinating syndromes in children. And in the next study, they had 101 children with relapsing syndromes. There were 61, I think, who were dis, um, given a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis subsequently, and eight aquapoin 4 antibody positive and 26 MOG antibody positives among the, the rest of the patients, which was only 40. So the MOG antibodies were, in some respects, distinguishable from the aquapoin 4 antibody patients. They were younger, more ADEM, less vomiting or area prostrema syndrome, more cerebellar symptoms, and, and they were better at the two-year follow-up. You can't see the data, but uh, they're summarized on the right. What was particularly interesting, I think, was to look at the MRIs and see whether you could actually begin to distinguish the NMOSD phenotype with aquapoin 4 antibody and the MOG antibody disease. And this shows you some of the um, samples of the illustrations that they provided. So there was deep gray matter disease with a linear pattern of external extreme capsular disease on, on the top left. There was cortical gray matter involvement. The lesions tend to be poorly marginated, both in the brainstem and the spinal cord. And cerebellar peduncles um, had these confluent, poorly marginated lesions, which reversed with treatment. And in fact, in some cases, there were really leukodystrophy dystrophy-like lesions in the MOG antibody patients. So these are not lesions that you would expect to get um, with uh, neuromyelitis optica, or indeed, I think, they're certainly not typical of, of multiple sclerosis either. 
So MOG antibodies have been useful to distinguish non-MS in children with relapsing demyelinating syndromes. And children with MS very rarely have the aquaporin-4 or MOG antibodies. MOG antibodies can be associated with neuromyelitis optic spectrum disorder, MDEM, or a proportion of relapsing optic neuritis. There are a few clinical features different between aquaporin-4 and MOG antibody disease, but none of them are really predictive by themselves. However, if you look at the MRIs as well, you can find that there really are probably differences, and I think that's an area which is beginning to be worked out better. So in the aquaporin-4 antibody disease, the lesions are mainly restricted to the brainstem and or hypothalamus, and they're destructive lesions, whereas in MOG antibody disease, they're fluffy, white matter lesions and often involve the cerebellar peduncles. Now, you can't see the graphs on the right properly, but what I thought was very interesting in this multinational study, which um, Yale and, and many colleagues around Europe put together, was that, again, there's something very special about those very young children, because it's the young children who get brain lesions and ADEM. So those are the most common in early life, Optic neuritis and transverse myelitis presented later. And that really just confirms what I've already told you, but in a very detailed um, and systematic manner. Again, the, the disease-modifying treatments were not associated with clinical improvement in children um, with MOG antibody-associated disease. And in neuromyelitis optica, um, they can actually be detrimental, as um, quite a few people have illustrated in the past. So azathioprine, mycophenolate, mofetil, rituximab, and particularly intravenous similar globulins were associated with a reduction in relapse frequency um, in children, and that was um, generally successful. But another aspect which also has been pointed out by, by Yale and her colleagues, and I think is very interesting and, and raises an important question, is children with MOG antibody-associated disease present with differences in the phenotypes, as I've just shown you. And the severe leukoencephalopathy phenotype seems to occur much more in the very young. So on the right, you can see three um, sort of age groups of children getting older as you go right. And this sort of typical or best example MRI is shown underneath. And you see that the leukoencephalopathy at the bottom left is really what happens in children whose average age is about four years at onset. So the question is, and this is one that, that Yale I know is interested in, is the very young myelinating brain particularly susceptible to MOG antibody mediated mechanisms of damage? And if that's the case, what's special about that young myelination? And why do the antibodies have such an effect at that age, even though it's still potentially reversible? So the importance of antibody-mediated forms of relapsing demyelinating diseases, um, in, in summary, is that the nmo aquaporin 4 antibody disease is important to diagnose as the lesions are destructive with long-term disability. The range of MRI findings have widened, and the 2015 criteria reflect the new findings of antibodies and the sort of widening spectrum. New treatments are beginning to be tried and the disease-modifying treatments should not, um, in, as a general rule, be used in the NMO patients. MOG antibodies are useful in the aquaporin-4 antibody-negative NMO patients, and they also distinguish from multiple sclerosis. And the phenotypes are wide in children in particular, and recurrent optic neuritis occurs at most ages, and in fact, there are now quite a few case reports of rare encephalopathies with much more of an encephalitis phenotype with MOG antibodies, but perhaps um, those are still very um, uncommon. And the, I think perhaps the most important thing for you as clinicians is that MOG antibodies are more common than aquaporin-4 antibodies, particularly in children under the age of 10, and they really are important to look for in patients with relapsing demyelinating diseases. So <clears throat> I'd just like to end with um, the list of some of the people who've helped over the years with this work, and they're very much underlined for those whose 
contributions were absolutely um, important and, and could not have been done without. And to mention that Yale is now at Great Ormond Street um, and working with Cheryl Hemingway, who is also, I'm sure, a name that you know very well, and Ming also at the Evelina with Michael Absud, and the Institute of Neurology, Olga Ceccarelli and Frederick Barkov are two great MRI experts in MS, and they've got really interested and excited about the pediatric demyelinating diseases associated with these antibodies, and I think that's a very good thing. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Vincent. Um, any questions, burning question, Professor Vincent has <coughs> elucidated the, what is coming next to all of us in future. Uh, any specific questions? And all tired. <laughs> oh, this one. Yes. Yeah, Brijesh. Uh, this is the, thank you for a great talk. Uh, this is a little unfair question, but you think we're going to find more antibodies because they're still in the same group. You don't always explain the... Mm -hmm. Well, um, unfortunately, that always seems to be the case that there are always patients who are seronegative. Look at Mars Senior Gravis. We had astarcalin receptor antibodies, but 15% were negative. <coughs> Then we have musk antibodies, but there's still about 5 to 10% who are negative. Then there's LRP4, but there's still, and I think that the spectrum widens as people find more antibodies and take more interest in the disease, and you're always chasing those seronegatives, but you never find, you never get there. I'm not, I know that people are trying hard to find new antibodies, but certainly using the appropriate techniques, it's not not, doesn't seem to be very easy. And we've certainly tried, of course, in this condition, these conditions, um, as well as in Mars Senior and many others. So unfortunately, I don't know. Probably there will be, but not in my lifetime, perhaps. Uh, just one more question regarding MOG antibodies. Uh, how do we monitor the progress of MOG antibody disease and how long the antibody positivity status in the serum would be there? Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. I mean, how, how long after, once, after the inception, once we start treatment, how long the MOG antibodies will, per, uh, will persist in the serum? <clears throat> That's an interesting question. With the assays that we've been, <clears throat> excuse me, with we've been using and um, also most people's experience, is that the antibodies don't stay very long in the serum, but in those patients whose antibodies persist, they are more likely to have a relapse. Some of them just disappear very easily, and one hopes that means they won't relapse, but you know, some of them still relapse. The antibody levels to MOG are not, at least in our assays, they are not very high titer, and that means that they can disappear relatively easily below the threshold. So I think if you're interested in whether you need to continue to measure them, it probably is a good idea if you don't think the patient's doing very well or if they have a relapse, it might be an indication that you need to treat them a bit more aggressively to reduce that antibody. But I'm sure Ming would have a much more informed opinion. No? Would it be advisable, like previously, uh, all these demyelinating disorders with, uh, after uh, starting the treatment, we do often follow up MRI after uh, six to eight weeks. So, I mean, two, two, two or three months into the illness. Uh, would it be advisable simultaneously to do MOG antibodies again at the same time and then decide about discontinuing the steroid treatment? Uh, would it be advisable to do that? Uh, I think this should be the last question. Thanks. So, in response to this question about using MOG um, teeters or MOG serially, um, at, at the moment, we do it because we'd like to know. I'm not sure we're confident enough with regards to utility of that. So as uh, Professor Vincent says, the main reason to do it is because if we know it's there, you're more likely to relapse. But patients relapse after having se become seronegative, and then they seroconvert positive again when they relapse. So that's you know, pretty difficult. Uh, monophasic, uh, well, we know that you know, if you take 100, 
you know, patients with MOC, only 30% of them will relapse. Maybe there are some extra risk of relapse with certain phenotypes. So I wouldn't automatically, uh, at least in a very well recovering patient, immediately report, uh, sorry, repeat the MOC, uh, nor, you know, repeat imaging unless clinically indicated. So <coughs> what I'm saying is that knowing the MOC positivity in this case should not change the way you manage them beyond clinically. So if they're very well, um, I would leave them until they relapse. But if they had a very severe NMOSD, certainly some groups um, would consider treating them like an aquaporin for NMOSD. But that is still debatable. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. We are just two hours <laughs> behind the schedule. And I appreciate all the delegates. There are still one. And we have one more session, one and a half hours to go. Thank you very much for this session. Thank you.